The 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, the first 11 verses, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of Scripture. That is the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 11. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And so Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your, you, you have no share with me. And so Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Most of us are quite familiar with the significant biblical sentence, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, we are here today to renew our covenant with Christ through the emblems of the cleansing of our lives as we wash each other's feet. We drink of the unfermented uh, wine representing uh, his blood shed uh, on Calvary's cross, and we eat uh, the unleavened bread, uh, symbol of his broken body for the forgiveness of our sins. A covenant that connects, bonds, and binds us to Christ's sacrifice and his resurrection, which one day will become ours and also victorious Christian living in the here and now. Covenant is a pledge, a guaranteed agreement based on trust. Covenants were arranged by mutual consent between two parties. And the word covenant literally means to cover in the sense of providing shelter, protection, financial support. So if I cover a bill, I pay for it. And in legal terms, covenant is similar to a contract or a treaty. Some covenants involve uh, an individual making a commitment uh, that affect others, such as last will and testament. So in some translation, they are referred to as testaments. So to make a covenant is to make a binding commitment. The very first time that God made a covenant was with Adam, which included a promise of enmity between the devil and humankind, as we find it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It is also known as the gospel in a nutshell. So to humankind, God said through Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
And this is precisely what happened at the cross. And after the flood, God made a covenant of protection of all people on planet Earth through Noah. And so we read that in Genesis chapters 8 and 9. And in chapter 9, verse 12, for instance, to the end of the chapter, we read that this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. Now today people take for granted those beautiful rainbows uh, that appear from time to time in the sky all around the world as if by magic and uh, not realizing that it is in actual fact God's covenant to humankind that there will not be another worldwide flood where all perished except Noah and his family. Now, chapter 15 of Genesis speak of God's covenant with Abraham, promising that he would become the father of numberless offsprings. So one evening, God took him out and said, Abraham, look toward heaven. That is Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. A number of a number of the stars. If you are able to number them, so shall your offspring be. So the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gingashites, and the Jebusites. Again, brothers and sisters, God renewed his covenant on Mount Sinai with Moses and the nation he chose and preserved. And in each case, God initiated the covenant, verses 18 to 21. And so in the upper room, coming to the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples celebrated the cedar, that is the Jewish Passover feast. And this involved a symbolic meal depicting the deliverance of the Jewish nation from the slavery of Egypt. And so the word Passover refers to the angel of death who passed over and spared the firstborn of Israel's children. And several symbolic foods were eaten, and Jesus took two of them, the wine and the matzot, that is the bread, and transformed them into what we now call the communion service. And Jesus is called our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, slain to save us from eternal death. His death on the cross hovers over us, covers us, and protects us from the death we deserved when he willingly and lovingly suffered the death that he didn't deserve. So the terms of biblical covenants were confirmed with a sacrifice. Noah and Abraham didn't go out and hire a lawyer. They didn't draft a covenant or sign a document. The Bible says that covenants were cut. So in the army, understand that you know, there are personal clerks that will cut a set of orders. But in Bible days, the word literally meant to cut. God was saying, in effect, do you mean business? Are you sincere? Is this covenant really, really important to you? Well, then, this is what you have to do. 
take your best lamb and kill it. Put it on an altar and cut it into pieces. Therefore, a blood sacrifice sealed the covenant. And so through his sacrifice and the shedding of his blood, each and every one of us has all of his or her sins forgiven, blotted out. God doesn't ignore or overlook sin because uh, there is a wages to sin. And we know that. Paul tells us in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. God's justice is satisfied. Sin exacts a payment. That is the payment of sin. And so before barcodes and electronic checkout devices, every item in most stores had a price tag that clearly told the cost. Sin, in God's eyes, carries a clear price tag, punishment. We can take the punishment, or we can accept the substitute provided for us. So in the Old Testament, people would confess their sin, they would admit their guilt, and then an animal would take their place. It was usually a lamb. The animal was the substitute. And the one presenting this sacrificial offering was indicating what's about to happen to this animal is what I deserve to happen to me. So the place of sacrifice emphasized the truth that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. That is Genesis 8.21. The way of forgiveness through animal sacrifice anticipated the sacrifice of Christ. And that's why the prophet Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. I will put my law into their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sin no more. So Jeremiah presented a covenant that had yet, not yet been cut. So centuries later, it was realized as Jesus declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is new covenant in that God himself provides and he is the sacrificed in Christ. It had never been done before. Jesus himself ratified the terms with his own blood. And so that's why Martin, Martin Luther exclaims, one drop of Christ's blood is worth more than heaven and earth. Sacrifices under the old covenant were temporary in nature. They had to be repeated. Or as the book of Hebrews explains, however, the sacrifice of Christ is a once and for all eternal covenant. Chapter 13, verse 20, which does not need to be repeated. So when we observe communion, we do not reenact Christ's sacrifice. We do not bring Christ down in the bread and wine and make it a real sacrifice as the Church of Rome claims to have the power to do through what they term the sacrament of the Eucharist. We remember it symbolically with the elements Jesus himself used. We do believe, however, that Christ is present at such occasions to bless his people that partake of those emblems. This new covenant is unconditional and undeserved because it's a covenant of grace. We can do nothing to earn it. All we can do is accept it and receive it by faith. We often disappoint the Lord, yet it, he does not disown us. We are covered in the terms of this new covenant. It is a promise to us 
that he will never break. We may decide to do so, to break it and turn our back on it, and that will break his heart. Uh, but he himself stands by his covenant to the end. The first covenant served its purpose, but the new covenant instituted by Jesus is far superior. The book of Hebrews explains that there is no point in returning to the sacrificial system under the old covenant because, chapter 9, verse 15, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So like a will that takes effect when someone dies, the new covenant was put into action at the death of Jesus. His death marks the transition from the old plan to the new plan. And so when we trust Christ, we are covered by this new eternal covenant and we become de facto heirs of an eternal inheritance. So how do we show God that we accept his covenant? In Bible days, after two people settled an agreement or contract, they would sit down together and share a meal. There's something about eating together is in there that binds people together. When we take the bread and cup at the Lord's table, we show that we accept the terms of this new covenant. And these are the terms. First, we are sinners. We are guilty before God. Then we deserve punishment. We deserve death. The wages of sin is death. All die in the end as evidence of that. All will be resurrected as well. Some will die again, repeating the reaping rather the consequences of consequences of unrepented sins and willful unbelief and disobedience, whereas others will live forever having repented, accepted Christ's sacrifice. There is no name under heaven whereby we shall be saved except that of Jesus and his lordship over their lives and being covered by his death. Then Christ, our substitute, took our punishment. His blood was shed for us upon the cross. Also, if we accept his sacrifice for us, then his blood covers our sins. We are forgiven on the basis of that sacrifice. God then writes his law on our hearts, and he enables us through the power of his indwelling Holy Spirit to live for him. So the bread and cup are signs of the new covenant. They point to the reality of the sacrifice of our Savior. Jesus is not talking about the cup per se itself, but what it contains and what it represents. Now, you've heard about uh, quests perhaps to find the Holy Grail, the actual chalice that Christ used in the upper room. It would certainly have uh, some archaeological significance, but the cup doesn't have any special powers. And there is no magic in taking communion. The cup we share doesn't save. Faith in what the cup represents, that's what saves us. After we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, we then confirm our commitment as God's redeemed people. So when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sins. Uh, they have been covered by the blood of Christ. Our pardon is sealed, and we are guaranteed eternal life. We are once again reminded that we are children of the new and everlasting covenant, whereby one day we will partake of the heavenly banquet that Christ has gone to prepare for us. That's when we will all receive our crowns of glory, and the mentions he promised to give each one of us. May he hasten that day, and may we never lose the meaning and significance of what we are about to do.
because each time we do that, we renew our trust in him, in that what he did, what he is doing, and what he is about to do. This is our saying to God, yes, to all of those three. And as we say yes, then we continue our commitment to him and our relationship with him is deepened every time we partake of the emblems of the body and the blood of Christ shed for us. May the Lord help us uh, to understand that and to apply it to our lives. Amen.